Yeah, welcome to the show. We've got uh, Mr. Michael Brown, who's Head of Market Intelligence at Caxton FX. Um, he's the leading Caxton's analysis and forecasting man across all financial markets and particularly G10 FX. And also a big welcome to uh, Western Nakamura, who's based out of Tokyo, as, as mentioned, a, a trader, former derivative trader at Goldman Sachs as well. And um, right now he's the global markets editor at Real Vision, um, doing a lot of work on there. And, and that's one of the, the ways I actually uh, came across uh, Western. Um, he also authors and, and owns uh, the website acrossthespread.com. Uh, you can follow there. Um, obviously, you can find all the full bios for, for these two gentlemen and all the rest of our guests um, on the Traders Summit uh, event page. Um, they'll have the, the various links, uh, social media links and everything there if you want to follow up after. Always follow these guys. They're, they're great follows if you're, you're in FX. Um, welcome, Michael. Welcome, Weston, uh, to the Traders Summit. Thanks, Ryan. Great to be here. No problem. Uh, Weston, I hope uh, you're ready to go, mate. Yeah, can you can you guys hear me okay? Or? I can hear you and see you perfectly well. Um, okay. Right now, I was Brown, thinking... To, nice, to, nice to meet you, finally. Um, besides our, our Twitter exchanges, uh, as they've as entertaining as they've been. <laughs> you two have been a little side-on relationship, have you? <laughs> Yeah, I mean we are, we're we're in the kind of two most active um, you know regions, Japan and UK. So, you know, I I, 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 so. I looked at him to call it for color on what's going on on the ground. <laughs> yeah, plenty, it's, it's, uh, it's, plenty it's, for us supposed to be talking about, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. That's the great thing with with social media in particular is that you you find different people who have knowledge of different areas and you you plug into them and it gives you that greater perspective um, over different parts of. Of what we all see and trade um very very interesting that's if you get in the right stuff on fintwit and things like that um so let's get into the show and I, I was thinking what what to call this this slot um what sort of title and i've, I've got <laughs> i've gone with uh, the title of uh, how screwed is and then we're going to insert the country as as we <laughs> go along um because <laughs> it pretty seems uh, seems to be the app title um so we're going to start with how screwed is Japan, um, and it's it's been quite a shock in in one sense because I was you know putting some notes together, you know listing some of the things that that's been going on in Japan, and when you when you write stuff down and actually see it back in black and white, you, I was sitting there thinking it actually seems quite scary. Everything that's going on, the the, the problems, the issues they've got, the the rabbit holes that the Bank of Japan are jumping into, it's really scary. Um, and Weston, I, I saw a couple of your videos uh, and pieces and, and you, you've touched on this as well. So I'm going to start with you and the Bank of Japan, you know, we've got the Bank of Japan. Here's a CB who's uh, intervening in FX. They're still easing monetary policy. They're buying up their own bond market. And this is coming while their own government is doing fiscal stimulus. It's not a great cocktail, is it? Um, also... 3% CPI, which is massive for yeah. Japan. Um, but uh, yeah, how screwed is Japan? I guess that would define on your, uh, that would depend on your definition of screwed. Um, <laughs> and if we're talking relative or we're talking, you know, <laughs> uh, absolute, uh, I would say Japan has been screwed for 30 years. And so therefore there isn't too much screwing left to do really. So in that sense, it might actually be, from here forward, be not so screwed. Um, it, it, the here, here's here's what I'll say regarding uh, what you what you touched on regarding monetary policy, fiscal policy, um, the debt burden, all the headwinds and all of that. Right. So Japan is uniquely unique, and people kind of say that like, but they don't really know. You know, that's just kind of like a talking point or, or something. Here's exactly what I mean by that. So Japan, in terms of uh, monetary policy, as I laid out in um, you know my kind of Bank of Japan videos that just started flagging since the beginning January of this year, saying like this is not a sleepy central bank. You must watch this central bank because of central bank divergence that's gonna that's gonna occur, um, and the fact that the uh, the Bank of Japan has been capping uh, you know a, a lid on DM yields for the better part of a half a decade via yield curve control, and this is that. So um, Japan in general more or less leads the other, you know, DM central banks and regions, very much including the Fed, the ECB and all that, 
um, by about, let's call it about 10 years or so, in policy experimentation. And so, th and th it's not, this is not like, not something that they want to necessarily do, it's that they have to because of the amount of debt and the demographics lead that they have. And so BOJ has to kind of venture out into, you know, um, what's at the time uncharted territory. So dropping rates to, ne uh, to, to zero and then leaving them uh, there, you know, QE, uh, in inventing QE, if you will. Uh, they weren't the first, you know, for to cut rates negative, but they are currently still negative uh, as the last center bank do so now that SMB's out. Uh, yields growth control, they're the first in there. They're, they've been doing that for six years. Uh, Reserve Bank of Australia had about a year and a half stint in it. Front end blew up in their face. They got out. Um, and um, and so so the BOJ is kind of, yeah, and then they own over, you know, uh, half of uh, government debt outstanding. So what BOJ does... You know, everyone watches the the Fed and or their own central banks, respectively, where you live. But every central banker is watching the Bank of Japan because, as a kind of a like a guide as to what to and what not to do. And so, uh, Mr. Kuroda is in a very sort of unenviable position of having to sort of lead, um, you know, for for better or for worse. And so that's that's basically what's going on with with, with Japan. So what happens with Japan? isn't going to be isolated solely within Japan. This doesn't happen in a vacuum in the third largest economy in the world. Um, what happens in Japan has direct implications uh, to global cross of markets as well as policy. Yeah, that's understood. And I think when, when I'm talking screwed, uh, it more maybe from the point of view that, that we know there's big issues there. We know that you know the aging population is a big issue. We know the level of, of debt uh, that the Bank of Japan are holding. Maybe it's a situation where, like you say, it's been happening for 30 years. Has everyone sort of brushed it under the rug? You know, it's there, but we're going to ignore it a bit like the Fed and, you know, being the, all the debt that they have. Everyone now and again says, oh, the US is going to destroy the world when their debt blows up. Yet it never does. It's brushed under the under the carpet. Is that the sort of situation we've got where when we say sort of screwed in, in Japan? Um, I'd say Japan is screwed in the sense that what you own when you own half of your sovereign debt market in the span of what well, they hoovered that up in really call it three years three and a half years or so like the bulk of that their, their holdings um and jgb market which used to be the second you know most liquid um and and most you know heavily uh traded and largest sovereign debt market in the world only second to the united states treasury market is now basically a you know, it doesn't trade at all, um, you know, most days uh, or some days, um, recently especially. And you have a yield curve in which the seven, eight, and nine year mature, or maturity of JGBs are not only yielding higher than the 10 year, which is where yield curve control is targeted at and therefore concentrated, but those maturities are above the yield curve control 25 basis point cap. Um, but Japan is screwed in the sense that they're very much painted in this corner of there is no unwind. There is no tapering. You don't, you can't sell um, JGBs into a market that you've destroyed that you own half of and which there's no liquidity for the other half for which you've been setting the price for, um, you know, artificially. So this is going to have to lead to some sort of continued buying to amass all of the remaining JGBs um, in order to do some sort of unofficial or official debt monetization or whatever it may be um, or or who knows where it's going to go but but there is no um, there is no sort of raising of rates and re normalizing of rates as as the ECB and the you know and every other policy um, DM policy is is, is currently doing uh, so in that sense it's screwed Luckily, Japan is structurally in sort of deflation. Uh, I was actually just talking to somebody earlier today. Um, you know, we had CPI numbers out today, but I was talking to a friend of mine. She um, works for a, uh, like an electronics manufacturer. And she was actually telling me about how um, one of their customers, one of their clients, they uh, asked her or their company, why are they raising prices? And that is such a stupid question, right? Like, it's, uh, it's obvious, like, it's global inflation, the yen is getting destroyed and all that. But they, nonetheless, they had to submit a paper in writing, like, fill out a form to their customers saying, here is why specifically we are raising prices on our goods. That is the level in which, like, raising prices in, in Japan and CPI is just that 
uh, sort of, you know, that much, that, that toxic. And there really yeah. is any, is no other place in the world in which that kind of culture exists. And because inflation is, a lot of it is so behavioral and culturally, you know, kind of established, um, these are sort of these, like, subtleties that you have to really take into account. You can't just look at it purely as an academic thing and compare it to the U.S. or the U.K. or uh, the ECB or, or, or the Eurozone or anything like that either. It is very much unique and on its own. So you might be able to have a situation where Japan continues to defy gravity, which, uh, you know, you can print yen to buy yen, which is essentially what they're doing. If they're intervening in the yen and they're also intervening in the rates market, two things that you can't, you know, you're not, you shouldn't be able to do by economic gravity. They, Japan could probably continue to do that for much longer than we think and probably uh, aiming to do so until at least Powell sort of, not pivots, but at least uh, uh, stops hiking so aggressively and then, you know, keeps the, the yield spread basically in, in check and therefore dollar yen to, to cap out. So... Yeah, understood. Um, so, Michael, what, what are your thoughts? And, and I know you're that Caxton's more on the, the physical side. You deal with customers, uh, you know, transacting around the globe uh, in, in real cash terms. Is, 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 in your opinion, you know, your view on, on Japan in general? But do you, do you have customers who who are talking about the the level in in the yen? Um, is it becoming a subject that's gaining more traction in a in a broader sense? It, it is more and more actually, which is surprising. Um, given, given that our uh, customer base obviously don't want to give out too much information about our clients yeah. but generally our, our flow is is not actually that heavily concentrated in the yen but even clients who don't trade the currency are actually now starting not only to talk about the levels in it they're also starting to ask about intervention you know the boj ministry of finance are intervening is this something we're going to start to see elsewhere can other are other countries going to be happy to uh, accept weaker currencies and all of that inflation that it's going to import so the the customers and the clients i'm speaking to not only are they starting to get uh, much more interested and invested in what's happening in japan but i think the reason for that is because they're starting to think if this is happening in japan as as weston alluded to earlier are we a decade or half a decade away from this sort of thing happening uh, in in this part of the world as well and, uh, that is obviously something that, that's been moving its head, particularly with with the dollar uh, moves that we've mm. seen, and that's something we're going to we're going to touch on shortly. Um, so let's let's get into to some of the 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 more in the now conversation. Um, obviously, we've had this big move in in dollar yen right now. Um, you know, trading up at one fifty twos. It's been all the way down to one forty six. A lot of nerves in the market. Um, when when the central banks are, or something like the BOJ is, is sitting on the sidelines waiting to intervene. Um, as I said, I, I don't know if you've had 100% confirmation. They have been in it. It looks more like they are than the, the blips we've seen uh, over the last couple of weeks, those 100, 100 tick blips. Um, so what does that mean for the Bank of Japan meeting next week? Uh, I mean, one of my, one of my questions was going to be before this, this move, were they going to keep their powder dry until that meeting? Because obviously it's expected that uh, Corona is going to stay unchanged. Um, so intervening now might have not brought any profits for them, if you like, because they're just going to be the same next week and, and they see the end week and once again. So, so what are your thoughts going into uh, next week's Bank of Japan? Is it going to be completely unchanged? Will there be any minor hints anywhere, do you think? Uh, so first of all, I just want to say, um, as of the last I checked before we came on here, um, so this isn't confirmed that the Bank of Japan, this this latest move that we just had in in dollar yen, just dropping what was it four big figures um, in in a half a half an hour, you know, starting from call it an hour and a half ago, uh, that was the Nikkei saying that the Japanese government, the Ministry of Finance, had intervened. The Ministry of Finance um, officials, the last word from them is that we're not going to comment on whether or not we intervened. Uh, but that was prior to this. So, again, this is not, like, confirmed by any means. The Nikkei is, let's just call it a shady organization. organization. <laughs> and um, and so they can very much just be kind of looking for, you know, clicks revenue and eyeballs revenue. Or they could just be working um, hand in hand with the, uh, with the government just to throw that out there. Just to see what the reaction would be. 
Um, and the the beauty of using the you know these sort of media outlets, which is what BOJ does and which is what Ministry of Finance does, is that they can test policy. You throw that out there, you see what happens, see what the reaction is, and if it's something that's undesirable, you could always come out and say that's wrong. That's not what we said. That's not which is exactly what happened with the Bank of England and the FT recently, you know, a few days ago. Yep. Um, but that's that's the beauty of doing that. They leak it. They use these media uh, media sources. They they leak them out. And if it's all fine and you know dandy, just like um, you know the Wall Street Journal um, heading into June of OMC with seventy five basis point rate hike from fifty um, and, and all that, like they they can that's that's the way that they communicate now, and that's that's kind of the reality. But as of now, we don't know. Um, I don't think that they actually did uh, intervene per se, and here's why. We have to remember this very basic thing. The a month ago, when the bank when the Bank of Japan why, by that I mean the Ministry of Finance acting through the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan is just the agency; they're not the decision making body. The Ministry of Finance is the decision making body as to whether or not to intervene. Um, the International Affairs Department, which by the way, Governor Crota, that was his old job at the International Affairs Department at the Ministry of Finance, so he knows that role quite well. So uh, last month, um, Bank of Japan Governor Crota. Uh, about 12 hours after the FOMC once again hike rates, once again was, you know, unchanged on his policy. And you see a continued yield spread. You see continued nominal yield spreads between uh, U.S. and Japan widen. And dollar yen was, you know, should have been on its way, you know, further higher. Um, and then you get uh, about 20 minutes after the BOJ pol uh, press conference, you get the Ministry of Finance coming out to announce, say that they've uh, intervened. Now, the point here is that what blasted dollar yen down five big figures in a half an hour at that point was not the intervention in and of itself. It was the announcement of the intervention. In other words, the intervention in and of itself, if they had been intervening and then once concluding that intervention, announced that they had intervened, then the intervention flow itself from the Ministry of Finance apparently had no impact, market impact whatsoever, such that they had to go out and say, FYI, we intervened. But once the markets got that message, like, you know, holy S, the, the government actually did a, a unilateral intervention, that's when you saw a short squeeze on yen futures and all that. So that was market-driven flow. So, um... The, the the Japanese officials don't really seem to have market moving firepower um, and that these sort of moves are not, this is not like um, a replication of what happened last time or anything like that because the last time again was a market driven move. So this may be a market driven move, uh, like, a, like a market participant driven move. Um, it might be, you know, uh, of Japanese officials moving futures markets, but um, let's just keep in that in mind that it wasn't the, the, the actual flow from the Ministry of Finance the last time that moved the markets. It was the market's realization um, and sort of algos getting triggered and systematic flows and momentum and all that and gamma squeezing on the options markets and futures that really moved the spot currency and not, uh, not the actual, you know, uh, the intervention itself. Yeah. So, so that $20 billion they supposedly spent, they just spent on a, on a newspaper article in, in effect. <laughs> Just the billion, the yeah. the, the, so the twenty billion, um, what they that did was it, you know, hopefully what they did was they tried to scare short sellers out so that they could buy time, so people, you know, um, so that they could buy time for for the the, the Fed to stop basically hiking. But uh, my 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 thought on that is that shorting the yen therefore might become the new. Uh, Widowmaker, because if people are basically kind of accepting the fact that okay, shorting JGBs at the bottom is a bad idea, then uh, and you can't technically support both the rates market and the currency market, but Japan defies gravity as we've as we know. Um, Japan might be able to do both, you know, uh, supporting the currency market as well as the rates market for longer than we think, and short the end just might be the widowmaker if you do it at these sort of levels. That's not to say yeah. it can't be tradable. You know, you could buy it after the fact, um, buy dollar yen after the fact, but um, but yeah. So, uh, but but with regards to your original question for BOJ next next uh, week. I mean, we were just talking about, you know, uh, before, you know, a few hours before, you know, heading into this, I was looking at dollar yen, you know, in the 150 handle, like well into the 150 handle, and then look what happened. So a week is a long time away from now, so I couldn't tell you what uh, what might happen then, but uh, policies then probably be unchanged. Yeah, cool. Michael, if you're in the Bank of Japan next week, you, you see anything uh, major coming from it? 
No, I, I'm pretty much in line with, with Western there. I, I don't think they're going to change anything anytime soon. I think Kuroda's term ends at the tail end of Q1 next year. And I think we're probably very unlikely to see any real notable changes in, in either policy or rhetoric and, until the, the new governor is in place. And with that in mind, it, it's you, you're kind of fighting a losing battle trying to prop up the value of the currency with the world's most dovish central bank. It's it, It's not going to work at the end of the day. Yeah, and that was going to be one of my next questions uh, regarding Corona going um, and who might come in. Do you think that the government will just want the status quo to be kept, Michael, um, or do you think they might want to change it up, um, maybe to someone a little more proactive or, dare I say, hawkish? What do you think of that? Well, I'll defer to Weston in a moment because he is obviously the expert on the ground. But I think if if the, the government's concern, as it seems to be, is with the valuation of the currency, with the speculation on the yen, with how weak the yen has, has got and, the, and the, the move we've seen today obviously symbolises that, then, you know, maybe there, there is every chance they go for someone a little bit more hawkish because um, if they are looking to intervene and if they are going to spend clips of $20 billion every couple of weeks to, to try and support the currency, it's simply not going to work if your central bank is uh, effectively moving in completely the opposite direction. But I will happily defer to, to Weston's expertise on this one. <laughs> I, 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 there is no expertise uh, with, with me. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, of course there is. Of course there is. So, yeah, you know, is, is it a possibility that the, the change of, of governor is going to bring something new? Uh, yeah, I th I think that um, so B Governor Crota has been the longest serving um, BOJ governor in modern history, and you know this Abenomics, this era one of Abenomics, or we could just call it Crotonomics at this point because the other two arrows were frankly missing, relatively speaking. Um, the it it doesn't matter who the uh, you know the governor or the the next governor or the BOJ governor is really um, but if they don't change policy in any way it doesn't matter what it is just change something just change some wording on, on something or do a whole revamp but if you maintain as is then you have adopted eight years of Corona's policies and therefore you're gonna have you've inherited this insanely volatile um, you know mess to try to get out of uh, should you try to get out of it so this is your one chance to hit like uh, kind of like a reset button without looking like the past eight years of blowing up the balance sheet to 120% debt, uh, uh, 120% of, of um, GDP and, you know, 500 trillion yen worth of JGB um, buying and all that was for absolutely nothing. You could just say, thank you, Kuroro, for um, achieving the 3% tar about 3 target uh, or 2% target. Um, thank you for your services. Please bow out. Let's move on to the next phase. And that's how they'll have to present it. But if they maintain the policy, then it, you, that's the one shot you have of uh, making any sort of tweak or change or anything like that. Yeah, understood. Um, right, well, let's let's switch it up a bit. Um, let's move on to uh, how screwed is the US? Um, I'm going to go to to Michael because the US is is hiking very rapidly. Um, but are they giving the economy enough time to absorb these hikes, uh, or do they risk being caught out again? But on the other side, I you know, do they face the economy suddenly crashing rather than than the soft landing? What do you think about that, Michael? Well, it's, it's an interesting one because clearly the, with the Fed have done a lot in a very short space of time. I mean, it was only in, what, March, I think, the first hike of the cycle. And we're already now talking about a fourth straight 75 basis point hike in November. Um, I, I don't think they had a choice, really. Um, the Fed, technically, they have a dual mandate. But this year, they've become a single mandate central bank. And that is get inflation back to 2%. And remarkably, despite all the rate hikes they've managed to deliver and the probably 100 and 50 basis points more, maybe 125 basis points more they'll deliver this year, that the labor market is still relatively resilient. But I think there's definitely some red flags as we move into not necessarily the tail end of this year, but particularly the, the early part of next year. Um, it, it is questionable how, and I, I know you've been flagging this a lot recently, Ryan, the housing market, the real estate market in the United States, that's clearly going to slow down as the, the impacts of higher mortgage rates take in effect. Um, the Fed themselves are admitting that the labor market next year is not going to be as resilient and not going to perform as well um, as it is this expecting unemployment at what 4.4 percent and i think that is an admission from policymakers already they're never going to say this out loud but it is an admission that 
the price they need to pay for having been so far behind the curve in late 2020 and the entirety of 2021 is not necessarily obliterating demand, but really reducing demand to such a degree that it is going to cause a sharp slowdown in economic growth. So the, the interesting dynamic for me is the fact that you're going to have, I would expect, this steep slowdown in growth as we move through 2023. But you're also going to have an environment where inflation remains persistently high. And in that environment, I don't think the Fed are going to look to cut rates. I think if they look back at history, you have a situation where, let's call it stagflation, that's basically what it's going to be. If you cut rates into a recession with inflation high, all you do is store up more pain to come further down the line. So I think you are going to see um, a, a soft landing is not going to happen. A hard landing might happen. It could be a crash landing. Who knows? Um, but I don't think you're going to see the policy loosening and the Fed put that we've seen in the last couple of decades when uh, we have seen the, ec the economy fall off a bit of a cliff. Yeah. I mean, just before I move, move to Western on that question, I mean, how crazy is it? I mean, they're effectively enacting monetary policy against one part of their mandate. Their dual mandate is is maximum uh, employment and price stability. And they're fighting inflation over jobs. And they're, they're basically saying to US citizens, they want them to be unemployed. They want them to yeah. be out of work so that they can fight inflation. I mean, it, we've had crazy times in central banks. Is, is that just not one of, one of the craziest situations? It, it defies it, it, it's baffling um you know the the message from the fed really when you when you distill it down is we're going to get rates high and we're going to keep them there and the impact of that is we need unemployment to rise by one one and a half percent and i don't quite think that that message has really filtered through certainly not to the, to the general public because as you say to get inflation to target for the fed to effectively be able to turn around and say we're doing our job again um it is going to mean hundreds of thousands if not millions of americans are going to have to lose their jobs yeah absolutely bonkers what what do you what do you make of that western you know the situation at the moment yeah. uh, with the policy yeah. over there I, so I mean I think that th so um, at Real Vision I have been you know kind of working on this broader theme of what I would call policy divergence. Policy divergence uh, has three sort of subcategories. One is central banks um, you know like amongst each other. Um, it's not just the BOJ versus everybody else, but you know there's there's sort of idiosyncrasies in there as well. Bank of Canada, so on and so forth. Uh, the second one, however, is uh, governments against their own central banks. Perfect examples are, let's see, the United Kingdom, um, as well as, but you see it in kind of different forms as well. You see it in Japan as well, Ministry of Finance versus Bank of Japan, um, and you see it in the United States um, as well as, just as Michael's been saying, you know, yeah, you're going to have to, like, you're going to have to have unemployment rise. Um, that doesn't go well during a midterm election year, uh, let alone ever. And so, but nonetheless, you know, you have the Fed who has, who is clearly just one, you know, uh, on a, on a one track mission, at least is, is what they're sort of, their, their, uh, both their actions and what they're kind of, you know, saying, um, is, but, um, this is the, this clash is what's going to cause so much, so, you know, sort of not just political volatility, um, but market volatility in and of itself is because when you have governments fighting internally with their own respective central banks, you, you know, I mean, just I, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about with the UK um, yeah. is a perfect example. But uh, outcomes are just and markets are caught in the middle, right? It's not like markets fighting the central bank or markets fighting against, you know, a particular fiscal policy or whatever it is. It's they're just kind of caught in the middle of it. And so it can lead to uh, like severe dislocations and, and, and all that, which can then um, snowball into further um, that have nothing to do with the original sort of, you know, issue at hand. So. Um, so yeah, I think it's very, they're in a very tricky spot, but it's not, they're not necessarily be, you know, like the Fed is not really in a unique situation in which they're at odds with their government. Yeah, no, so that's a very good point you make. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about yields then, because, you know, yields have been rising. They've been rising globally, but obviously a lot of eyes on the US. E even today, yields are across the curve hitting new highs. Um, a lot of people starting to talk about a bomb meltdown. Um, do you think... Western, this is a this is a meltdown right now, or is this just reflecting, or yields just reflecting where the Fed is going with rates at the moment? Okay, so this is actually um, I, I want to ask uh, Michael about this as well, or um, or maybe you as well, uh, Ryan. But um, so 
depending on where where you're talking about, right? So in the U.S., I mean, say it's been kind of the way I look at the S and P. It's been orderly the sell off. Us, it's been a, a you know significant sell off, unless, mm. but it hasn't been this sort of March 2020 sort of moment um, either. However, if you look at you know what happened with UK gilt at the long end, that was much more so a you know what seemed like a very kind of technical lack of liquidity, you know systems broken essentially um mm -hmm. as opposed to like fundamentals really getting kind of priced in necessarily um and uh and so those two sort of those, those are two like very different like uh situations one is what one is like more so reflecting matters of inflation and monetary policy the other is just a you know systems gone haywire um, so, you know, take your pick, but I think that the, the U S so, yeah, so the U S side has been orderly so far. That's not to say that it can't, you know, find itself in a situation in which a lack of liquidity in the U S treasury market, um, will, can, can explode the, the long end, um, as well. And really for any market too, as, uh, including in Japan and, um, yeah. and the UK still. Yeah. Uh, so what are, your, what are your thoughts there, Michael? Do you, do you think uh, this is a problem in yields or it's just a, a reflection of rates? No, I, I think Weston's right. I mean, the, the move has been huge and the move has been relentless. I mean, I think the 10-year, the I, I haven't checked the stats for this week, but it, it sold off for 11 weeks in a row, which is a, a relentless pace of selling in the bond market. But it warranted by the fundamentals that we see in the economy by the never-ending stream of hawkish fed speak that we're getting from pretty much any official who manages to get near a microphone it's warranted by the facts that we're looking at a terminal rate probably around four and a half maybe even up towards five percent in, in 2023 and the fact that rates are going to stay at that level for a, a prolonged period of time so I, I don't think we're at the point where bonds or treasuries are broken yet um but as we all know the uh, and as we saw in the uk and as we saw when the pandemic broke out in march 2020 these things can change very very quickly um and it may not have to be the bond market itself breaking in order for for treasuries to to become disorderly it may be the equity market liquidity there dries up there's a big sell-off and that triggers something in the treasury market um it, it could come from an external catalyst but i think for me at the moment the the move that we've seen is is wholly warranted by by what we're seeing in the economy and by what we expect to see in the economy as well yeah no, exactly and just to give to give my 10 cents um my view is that, that as long as as yields reflecting where the fed is likely to go or like you say maybe a top of five percent as long as you stay in and around that boundary, I don't think there's a problem. I think the problem comes when yields break above the Fed's ceiling, if you like, and move away from what the Fed's doing. That, mm. to me, will be a, a potentially a clear signal. There's something going on that isn't Fed-related or isn't fundamentally related. Obviously, a couple of inflation prints down the road, we could be seeing the Fed set a ceiling at 6%. Who knows? Um, but in, in the meanwhile, for, for any traders who watch yields, just keep an eye. As long as we don't go above that Fed expected ceiling, um, I don't think we're gonna we're gonna be heading to any problems. Yeah, Ryan, um, yeah. can I follow up yeah. on what you just said there? Because I, the, yeah, I love sure. that point you just made, and so um, that that's the point is that exactly like it's it's rate volatility, um, not really rate levels, right? And so what that's the, that's the kind of distinction I was trying to make with like the UK versus the the US. Like when you hear about things like um, you know, so 30, 40 year gilt. Uh, had a higher five-day realized vol than um, Bitcoin or something, right? So yeah. that's like a, you know, it's, it's, it sounds like a nice sort of thing to say or whatever. But that's actually kind of a significant, like, statement because why don't pension funds hold Bitcoin? Because it's too volatile. Well, if you have their the assets that they hold that are more volatile realized than Bitcoin, then what are they going to do? They're going to have to shed them at you know at, at fire sale pace. So yeah. um and and so when you have hundred basis point swings or 25, 30 basis point swings of the intraday, uh, every day that is very wholly different, right? So uh, I just want to you know to your point, you know.
Yeah, no, it did. For, for someone who, you know, I come from a, a futures background, trading on the live floor, so I know, you know, how the how bonds used to trade. And the, the bond market was always like the, the, the elder statesman, the grandfather of the market. You know, it never used to be volatile. Now, now it's moving around like, uh, like the Turkish lira. It's, it's absolutely crazy. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> but uh, okay, so let's let me let me throw you both a uh, a million USD question, a million dollar question. What or when causes the turn in the dollar? And go on, Weston, you can you can have that one first. The dollar versus what? Because I mean, you yeah. look at the dollar yeah. XY right yeah. now, and you look at the dollar yen, and so they're. Then let's, let's just talk, talk generally, because obviously it's been a it's been one way traffic virtually against it, every other currency. Um, is, is it purely the Fed, the Fed turn or, or the Fed top in, in rates? No, I think that I actually think this is going to sound controversial. Um, and frankly, I don't care. But um, I think that you were you're probably likely to get not necessarily an official, but like hints of or rumblings of uh, some sort of Plaza Accord Part 2 or like an actual uh, U.S. U.S. sort of administered or U.S.-led um, USD intervention or USD sort of uh, stepping in to um, calm the dollar down before you get an FOMC pivot is kind of my timeline of things. And because that and that would be the what the Fed breaks. It might be simply it's breaking the dollar to the upside that's breaking things. Yeah. Uh, well, just before I go to Michael, because that, that what you said just sort of leads me into into my, my next question and uh, um, point is, you know, hypothetically speaking, let's say the Fed have to go higher on rates uh, than, than the current. Let's call it the ceiling of five percent. Um, you know, inflation doesn't play ball for, for rate hikes and, and that goes up. So they're forced to maybe go up to five, six percent. That's obviously going to bring further moves in yield, further strength in the dollar. Would that potentially push us towards maybe some coordinated action because of that dollar strength having a bigger spillover in the global economy and then obviously the waves washing back towards the US if that happens? Yeah, I think I think so. I think that well, the U.S. is obviously very self, is only self interested. Central bank of the world, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, recently, two was it two weeks ago at the G, um, G5 or G20 in Washington, they actually did actually you know acknowledge like yeah, we need to be mindful of spillover effects and all that. So there is like some of that going on. But until it washes up on U.S. shores, which it will at some point, the do the strong dollar you know is. Um, not going to be, uh, you know, it, just because it's like the, the U.S. might be the last man standing doesn't mean that it's going to be a pleasant last man standing experience. Um, and so once that kind of really hits, um, maybe even like the political side at home in, at, at, in the U.S., um, then that will that will cause that sort of, uh, you know, rhetoric turn. But yeah. 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 Uh, Marco, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, set, setting aside the potential for, you know, coordinated intervention, I, I don't think just on the Fed pivot, Q1 2023 at, at the absolute earliest in my mind, and almost every inflation print that we get at this point pushes that expectation back by a month, um, even though the market front runs it before the print and then prices it all out again. But we've, we, can, we can go through that another time. Um, I think in terms of what causes the turn in the dollar, is a dovish Fed going to do it? Well, you've got to consider why would the Fed be turning dovish? They'd probably be turning dovish either because growth has slown to a degree that is unacceptable um, for, for them to deal with, or they're turning dovish because there's been some sort of, of financial accident, which, let me be clear, I'm not predicting, but given what we saw with, with gilts and the LDI um, stuff a couple of weeks ago, it, we're not, we, we might be on, on the precipice of one if something else like that would to take place. Um, and if either of those two things happen, if the Fed pivot dovish because of a, a financial accident, do you want to be selling the dollar? Absolutely not. Um, if the Fed pivot dovish because of US growth becoming uh, slowing to an unacceptable degree, um, you've got to think, is that going to be a, a US specific factor or is that going to be a global factor? Well, you've got to wager it's going to be a global factor, given that the US economy, yeah, it's not in great health, but it's surely in better health than the Eurozone, in better health than Japan and better health than, than the UK. So I think the, the only way we see, in my mind at least, a, a sustained 
move lower in the dollar is one some sort of um, concerted effort to to intervene to to weaken the greenback or two is we see a pickup in global growth in other developed markets in the UK in Europe in Japan that takes growth rates above the growth rate that we see in the United States and in my mind I, I don't think either of those are likely over over the medium term to be honest. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting point. It, it's almost could become a zero sum game, you know, if, if the mm. Fed's forced to pivot, like you say, it's not they're not may not be alone. Recessions elsewhere, other central banks pivoting. We're just in the, in the same boat in terms of rate divergence, um, yeah. just going the other way. And, I was going to say we're in pivot. divergence on the way down rather than divergence on the way up, aren't we? Exactly, point? exactly. Um, that's that's a very interesting point. Um, Let's move on quickly to the UK. We've got a few minutes left, uh, so let's see if we can squeeze some uh, some of the UK circus stuff going in. Um, <laughs> how screwed is the UK? <laughs> we could probably do a show on its own on this one. Um, so I don't know where to start with this one, but I'll start with you, Michael. Um, you know, trying to, to look through what we see in the press, and I know you fight the press narrative as much as I do. Are we really screwed here in the UK or is this the same economic issues that everyone's facing? No more, no less. It's just been under the magnifying glass a bit more, um, which obviously every other country is happy with because then they're, they're not under the microscope. Um, so do, do you see any upside situation to the UK um, at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think there is certainly a little bit of that going on. Um, I think when you boil it down and when you take all of the, the media hysteria and the shortest ever PM and the you know chancellor who's in the job for three weeks, when you kind of take all that out of it, um, from a market point of view and from an economic point of view, what's happened in the UK is we've gone from a fiscal policy which was probably just about right to one that was massively too loose and which markets obviously and, and probably rightly were, were worried about. And we're now on the, the 31st of October, or whenever the, the medium term fiscal plan is delivered, going to go to a fiscal policy, if you if you believe what, what's currently being briefed, that is way too tight because Jeremy Hunt is undoing all of the tax cuts, possibly raising taxes, income taxes, VAT, um, and bringing in big, big government spending cuts to plug this 40 odd billion pound black hole in the public finances. Now, this isn't something that's unique to the UK. I think it may just be a case of the UK is going through this before other countries go through it because no one's public finances let's be honest, are in that good shape, particularly after a couple of years of pretty much endless government spending during the pandemic. Um, the upside yeah, they, scenario... They Germany today, you know, yeah, voting against exactly. uh, the debt break, you know, the perfect example. Sorry to interrupt you there. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I, I think you're going to see that sort of thing in more and more countries, particularly in uh, in Europe. So I guess for me, the upside scenario is is really avoiding the worst case scenario, which is bringing the the, the sort of fiscal policy lever away from the, the way, way, way too tight where Jeremy Hunt is, is probably about to put it. Um, obviously, we don't know who the prime minister is, is going to be. Um, if Rishi Sunak gets the job, you, you would expect that things would um, strike a little bit of a better mix. If Boris comes back, then, you know, who knows where we're going to end up in terms of, of policy. I don't think Boris knows yet. He's probably uh, on a private jet somewhere uh, or on a beach. But I think the, the upside scenario for me is fiscal po preventing fiscal policy from getting too tight um, and also the, the Bank of England raising rates by less than the market expects. And I think there was a, I don't want to drone on for too long, I'll, I'll just make this point. I think there was a very interesting speech from Ben Broadbent, the, the BOE's deputy governor yesterday. Um, the market price is in the bank rate getting to what, five and a quarter percent in, in the middle of next year. Um, Broadbent was about as explicit as a central banker can get that the BOE aren't going to raise rates by that much. So if you can put those two together, then, you know, we're, we're probably uh, maybe a, around the point of peak pessimism when it comes to the UK economy. Cool. And just before I switch to, to Western, I want, I want to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, if it, it, will it be Rishi or Boris for PM and who will the market like? Uh, I'm going to answer that in reverse. The market will like Rishi. Um, I think that that's pretty clear <laughs> given the, the reaction that you saw. Sir. <laughs> Given the reaction you saw in, in Gilts earlier when Boris became the bookie's favourite, I think that speaks volumes. Um, who's going to win it? My gut feeling is it will be Sunak. Um, if the MPs get to decide on their own, I'm sure it will be him. Um, if it goes to the membership, then Boris obviously has a decent stab at it. But uh, yeah, I think uh, PM Sunak will, will be uh, the most likely one for me. 
Yeah, cool. Um, so, Weston, if I can take you on a, a slightly different start, uh, slant, but please feel free to, to chip in on anything to do with the UK. W w yeah. What's the view of Japan on, on the UK? Um, is, is it newsworthy over there, or is oh, it just yeah. a buy? I mean, is it something you're watching for something like uh, the pound yen? Look, uh, when it's when when lettuce heads are trending in Japan too, it's not, <laughs> you know like the like the the thing is like J Japan <laughs> like I was joking around saying like um UK is like the Japan of um you know like like policy you know blundering and all that uh, obviously Japan is the Japan of that but. Um, but the, what what I'll say is that um, so it's, I'm really glad you asked me about that, uh, Ryan. This this view from Japan because there's a lot of people who say um, that um, you know the, the what's happening in the UK is this is like a warning from markets to um, to go governments who are overspending, who are used to these like you know zero rate policy, and to get your fiscal house in order because markets will punish you uh, into submission and will vote you out. Uh, if not for you know you know if you don't right and the UK is a perfect sort of example and and uh, you know a, a watershed moment for that. Here's what I'll say to the I have a slightly different take right uh, and they're saying that with regards to um, looking at you too Japan or especially you Japan right. Here's what I'll say is that the UK guild blow up okay and the reaction to perceived you know untenable fiscal policy such that called for the BOE to step in and you know cap the long end. So, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Fight Club, but, you know, in the beginning, he kind of talks about these, like, single-serving, like, lifestyles. Single-serving, like, um, cream, single-serving butter, single and like, single-serving friends and all that, right? What the Bank of England did in the, in the temporary sort of 180 reversal from QT agenda to now they're suddenly stepping into the market to bid for unlimited guilds and capping the, the long end of the guild curve, that's single-serving yield curve control, right? Mm -hmm. Bank of Japan rolled out yield curve control six years ago, hasn't touched policy since, they're not doing single serving. They're doing, they've signed up for a lifetime Costco membership of unlimited yield curve control, right? And they've done so over a half decade. So from the BOJ's perspective, watching the events of the UK over the last few years, I think that it just further kind of solidified and justified why they put in yield curve control, why they're going to maintain it, that this is the policy that makes sense. Because if we didn't do that, this is what happens. Like the JGB market would have blown up much further and uh, much, much higher and, and uh, you know, much longer ago but we put in measures to mitigate that for the first place the uk did not have that that's why they had to you know grab for a life jacket at the, the last moment but that's why we have that there and that is why we cannot take our foot off of that uh off of that 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 pedal and so i think that what the uk did directly reinforced the bank of japan's view right or wrong i think that this is what they're thinking is that this is exactly why we have yield curve control Cool. So, uh, yeah, reinforcing their case, as it were. Um, well, gents, it's it, it's been a very quick forty-five minutes. Um, it's been absolutely Flame brilliant mark. to have, have you two guys on. Um, lots of insight there. Um, I don't know if any of the, the guys in the background have been keeping an eye on the the, the questions, um, but it's been great to, to speak to you and get your views. We could probably do this ten times over uh, in great depth and all, and everything, but. Unfortunately, the clock is against us. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Western Nakamura, and you, Michael Brown, for coming to Traders Summit and uh, making this, this event awesome. Thank you very much.